Welcome Mechanics and Materials students to our final lecture on beams. In this lecture we're going to take a really simple beam cross section, rectangular and solid, and we're going to load it um, with simple supports and a uniform distributed load. So this would be applicable to a dead load. So our, our W in uh, force per unit length could easily be the beam's weight. Uh, if there was some uniform load being applied to it, maybe like another beam, if this were holding up a bridge deck, something, uh, or a, maybe a tank of a liquid, um, that would also be something that would apply a uniform load across it. So we're going to look at um, all of the stresses and deflections for which we've already derived um, expressions in this in this discussion on beams in our in our six part lecture we're going to apply it to this simple beam so we're going to get expressions for longitudinal stress shear stress especially the maximum um, in terms of this uniform uh, load this this w which could be weight and the beams dimensions are t and c and then we're going to look at how that varies um, along the length of the beam in our x direction. So just to start out, we've got we've got some simplifications. We've described our dimensions in terms of 2c and 2t. This is going to make it easier to express moments of inertia and various shear components. And we've described the length uh, of the beam between supports as 2l. So we're going to start with with uh, putting the beam into static equilibrium. So we are going to integrate our weight per unit length, or excuse me, our force per unit length being applied in the downward vertical direction, could be weight per unit length, and then we're going to oppose it with our supports, uh, constrain the beam to not having any net moment, and that basically says that we have to have a uh, an upward support force of LW at each of the two supports. So having done that, we are going to get expressions for shear and of shear force and moment as a function of position along the beam. We're going to work from left to right. So we're going to start with our rightward support showing an upward force of LW at x equals zero. We're showing our distributed load and then our cut beam uh, here and then the moment and force that would be exerted by the beam that portion we cut off is represented by V in the downward direction and M uh, going uh, counterclockwise. Positive default. So V and M, we don't have any N. We don't have any, any actual stretching or compressing of the beam. So our axial uh, stress, our sigma XX, is going to come purely from flexure in this case. That means our neutral axis will be at the centroid of our cross-section. But first, let's get our V and M. So we're going to integrate our distributed load with X to get expressions for our, uh, our shear force at any X uh, minus our shear force at, at some reference. We're going to start at zero. We have one section of interest, which is the whole beam. We don't have to break up over different X increments. We don't have any concentrated loads. We don't have any changes in our distributed load. So we're going to integrate V from V equals zero to V at some X anywhere along the beam. We're going to integrate our, our distributed load, which is a downward load with respect to X from zero to some X. So that's going to give us an expression for our shear force at any X of negative W, our distributed load times X plus LW. And of course, our LW is our lower, basically our lower limit of integration on V. So at X equals zero, V must be exactly equal to our, our upward support. To get moment at any X, we integrate again. Uh, so we take our entire expression for V and integrate it with respect to X between zero and, and X, and any X along the, along the length of the beam, because we end up with an X in both terms, our lower limit gives zero. So this entire right hand side is equal to negative w over 2 times x squared plus lwx. Uh, that's going to equal moment at any position minus moment all the way over here at zero. And since this pin support can't impose a moment, uh, the moment being provided by the side of the beam that we cut off also has to be zero. So m at zero is zero. 
and our moment anywhere along the beam is negative w over 2 times x squared plus L, lwx. Now let's do a, a quick check. Intuitively, it's um, we think it, it probably wouldn't be unreasonable to imagine that the maximum shear would be at the endpoints and the maximum moment would be in the middle. So let's just do a quick check of that. So let's set our shear equal to zero and see see where it's it's zero. So basically it's going to be zero at x equals l right in the middle. That's an extrema. Um, so we can then ask, okay, is moment a maximum or a minimum there? Um, we've got a negative of here. So the expression should be concave down with respect to x. So we'd expect a maximum. If we put l in, l squared in both cases, we're going to get an an L squared W over 2 uh, subtracting from an L squared W so we'll end up with an L squared W over 2 positive so the middle is indeed max moment uh, if we look at different values for shear as we go from X equals 0 we'll have of course shear is is LW if we put in X equals 2L uh, shear goes in the other direction but it's it's also uh, going to be maximized. So looking at places along the beam where we're going to zero in and say, okay, when we know what portion of our cross section to look at and what expression to use, those are the X positions where we're going to expect to maximize moment and maximize shear. So we'll put those to work for our longitudinal and shear expressions. Speaking of which, Let's look at our, our longitudinal stress from bending or bending stress. If we take a look at our cross section, uh, the centroid of our cross section is also the, where the neutral axis is going to pass, so that's pretty convenient. And we also know that the maximum y distance from our, our centroid to any point on the beam cross section is c. So of positions on the cross section in the y direction our, our bending stress is going to be maximized at y equals c and also at a, an x position of l. So now we can deploy the flexure formula making a quick detour to remind ourselves that the moment of inertia about the z-axis for this particular shape um, where that z-axis is passing through the centroid is 1 12th times the base times the height cubed, which gives us 4 thirds TC cubed. So this is why we started with those two times expressions. This makes it easier. So we can load that into the flexure formula. So we have negative in the front. Then we have moment at any x. We have y and we're using the maximum y and it's below the neutral axis so it's got a negative sign and here's our izz so in terms of x we can simplify and get a two-term expression and then if we acknowledge the fact that we know moment is a maximum at l uh, we end up with a, a fairly simple expression for maximum longitudinal stress, normal stress, um, in the x-direction, longitudinal direction in terms of our load, w, our beam length, our beam width, and our beam height. So let's look at what's, made, what's linear, what, what's uh, squared terms. Our load is linear, our beam width is linear, so we can trade one off for the other. The wider we make the beam, the more, the more we can load it, and that's a one-to-one. -one. Beam length is squared. So you know, for every every if we double the beam length, we're going to quadruple the axial stress at its maximum point. And same thing with the with the beam height. So now we we have a better idea of why when beams are are loaded vertically, we tend to go with a non-uniform cross section. Then they're kind of taller than they are wide. So that's going to definitely, you know, for any given need to span a given length, a given, um, a given distributed load, if it's uniform, we're going to want to we're going to want to maximize our height, the expense of thickness.
um, for a given a given you know effectively given cross-sectional area which equates to uh, weight uh, per unit length of beam okay now what if what if we're good there what if we meet our safety factor against yield or, or fracture if it's it's a fracture susceptible article but now we got to worry about it deflecting too much we don't want it you know impinging on a bearing or or lifting up too much and and maybe somebody can't can't um, move something over it so now let's look at deflection so we know from our deflection expressions that um, the first derivative with position of our deflection angle, our flexure angle, the slope that our the actual curve of the beam when it's flexed makes, is our moment um, divided by the beam's uh, tensile modulus times i, and this is i z z that we have right up here. So we can integrate that from zero to some x, and integrate m over ei with respect to x and of course m is dependent on x and thank goodness for us we've got a nice expression so we can drop that right in and so we can get this expression our deflection angle anywhere is the first integral of our our moment divided by ei first integral with respect to x plus whatever our flexure angle was at zero we don't know what that is, so that's one of our mysterious constants of integration in our, in our deflection uh, expressions. So let's just hang with it. Let's keep it in there. We're going to call it theta at zero. It is a constant. It is a single number. So let's integrate this entire expression again with respect to x and set that equal to the difference between the, the deflection at zero and the deflection anywhere else. And because we're going to integrate from 0 to an x, we're going to end up with an x in every term. So our lower limit of integration on this right-hand side is going to disappear. So we're going to end up with an expression of the deflection, how far the beam lifts up or sags down at any position x along the beam, uh, minus that deflection at 0 is going to be equal to our, our first x derivative which is basically going to end us giving a, a, a fourth order polynomial. And then our first constant of integration, that theta at zero, is going to be multiplied by x. Um, we, we know that our, our lower limit of integration for deflection over there at x equals zero is zero because the beam is sitting on a support and it doesn't pop up or down because it has to stay, stay connected to the support. It might deflect there in, the, in that it might have an angle. It may not be perpendicular to the sport. It might be, be like this instead of like that, but it isn't going to pop up. It's, it's attached to the support. So that has to be zero. Furthermore, that we know that's, that same case is true for the other end. We, even though it's a pin, uh, since we don't have any moment at one support, we can't like have it you know, sticking up in the air. It can, again, be, ha be at an angle, but it has to be connected to the support. So we know that little v deflection at 2L is also 0. So we impose that. We set this whole expression equal to 0. And then we input 2L for all of our x's. When we do that, we're able to solve for our deflection angle at 0 and at 2L, as far as that goes. And so we get an actual value for that in terms of the load, the length of the span, moment of inertia, and our tensile modulus. So we can feed that back into our deflection uh, angle and deflection distance equations. And here we go. Now we have an expression for the deflection angle anywhere and the deflection, actual deflection anywhere. And not surprising, we could probably find that since moment ends up being a zero at the endpoints, we know that our deflection angle will be extreme. It will, it will have its extreme value at the endpoints. And in fact, these are the values. So we, we have our biggest angle the beam takes at the ends, its biggest slope, literal physical slope. Um, and it, its biggest sag, <laughs> its biggest actual deflection is in the middle.
so if we put in L for X we would get the the amount of beam sag so we'll, we can see that again we've got EI so in the denominator of each of these expressions so um, the bigger EI is the lower the magnitude of of our deflection regardless of the other the other terms our load again is linear um, so uh, span on the other hand is to the fourth power so you don't want that to sag make it shorter uh, that's got much much bigger effect than the actual load so unfortunately that means you got to build more supports but there you go if you are deflection limited go with short beams there's a, a huge difference in dependence so that leaves shear uh, lucky for us there's really only one kind of test cut we need to make in the cross section to evaluate shear and that's straight across the cross section at some test y above the the actual entire cross section centroid and so here's our little cut piece so the thickness of the cut piece is is twice the actual beam width thickness and then our area is going to be this dimension our area that goes into our q is this dimension times 2t so now we can really see the power of area uh, and, and y distance in our q and we'll see that as we actually come up with an expression for q so we can we can leverage our formula for average shear averaged along this 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 width in the z direction so we've got tau average times that that width which in this case is 2t so the shear t is is 2t our our base dimension times whatever the shear force is at that point and of course if we want to know where the worst case is we're going to look at the shear at those endpoints so that would be LW times our Q factor divided by our our IZZ moment of inertia so again here's our shear anywhere and if X is 0 you know we've got our maximum so that leaves an expression for Q so we can take a look at our geometry so here's the here's the centroid of our little cut area so we can express the distance between that centroid and the whole cross-section centroid um, as in terms of C and Y so that ends up being C plus Y over 2 and then our area is going to be C minus Y times 2 T so here's our area here's our, our Y bar so Q is just those two multiplied so just multiply them out and we get this expression so now we can get a real gauge how does Q vary with Y so if we say well at Y equals 0 we're right at the centroid this is obviously maximized and when Y equals C out on the end is 0 so we can see that for the simple rectangular beam Q is maximized at the centroid so that's where we're going to get the biggest shear shear stress in in a plane in the the X Z plane it's also going to be maximized um, um, on our on our X Y phase so basically looking again if we are looking at a plane going right through the centroid we're gonna have our, we're gonna have a tau that is that is maximized here it's gonna be maximized there basically so this is a, a Z ZX plane with a normal in the Y direction so it's on the Y Y face but is buried down inside of the inside of the beam okay so we can drop our Q into our main expression so we have our tau average times 2t times V times Q divided by IZZ so unlike our, our other examples uh, where we looked at shear where, where uh, a T dimension over on this side in our shear flow expression on the left kind of canceled with, with one portion of our area expression in Q, here it doesn't because our T within the Q expression 
cancels within the T that's a component of our moment of inertia. So now it's real easy to see how when we divide both sides of the equation by 2t to isolate our average shear stress, we end up with t in the denominator. So um, the, the smaller t is, the bigger tau average is. So take, take y to 0, so we sit on the neutral axis. Take x to 0, so we're right adjacent to the supports. And if the rectangle is, is, is skinnier, we're going to maximize shear stress. So there's an interesting idea about where we want to put our, our dimensions. We need a bigger C, a bigger height dimension, to minimize deflection and to minimize longitudinal stresses. But we need a bigger T, we need a bigger width dimension to minimize shear. So. Can't, you can't skimp too much anywhere, <laughs> which is why we need to look at both types of, of internal stresses, stresses in our beam um, associated with our loading so we know how to make the best balance of design. Okay, a little bit of discussion here that I won't go over, but this is just a reminder that we used we used this this plane with a y normal, so we really used tau y x to to calculate our our shear this this tau bar is really based on a tau y x as, as we noted when we derived the expression this expression for shear average shear but because of the symmetry of the stress tensor it's also equal to this tau x y which is in turn related to our v so that's just just a little reminder of that so just continuing from that, we can say our tau xy at any x and then at any y is going to be this expression. So if we changed our loading, we wouldn't necessarily, this, this expression might change. Uh, we might not have a maximum shear force at x equals 0 and x equals 2L. Um, so this value might change. And obviously, if we changed our cross section, our, um, this portion of the expression would change. Uh, we can we can take a look at extrema. We can rearrange this to make it much easier to see that uh, we're going to have our our max value at y equals zero, and then we can you know again look at where our max value of v is. So if we wanted to have a general expression, we can say we're at a max uh, with a magnitude that's really three halves times um, whatever our shear force is over the cross-sectional area of the beam in this case. That's particular to this loading and to this beam area. So if that, if you were balancing different factors, light weighting, balancing longitudinal stress deflection and shear, that expression might come in handy. Uh, but you could also just use this one. So to recap, uh, we have now an expression for maximum shear if we plopped in x equals L and, and y equals 0 in terms of our loading, our height, our thickness, we've got an expression for maximum deflection, um, again, in terms of those same three, and maximum longitudinal stress. If we wanted to write ourselves an expression for weight of the beam per unit length, we would have our 2c times 2t um, times the the density of the material per unit, you know, the density, and you know, get a weight per unit length. So now we have we can balance those, we can put them together, and depending on what our constraints are, we can optimize one or another um, of these properties according to what we need. Typically, um, our stresses will have limits with safety factors. So we'll be we'll be looking at our our sigma xx as being limited probably by uh, resolved shear stress, and would we would apply a safety factor against yield. If we had any kind of fracture susceptibility, we would be looking at this against maybe some kind of fracture criteria 
probably uh, a K1C with a substantial safety factor. Uh, deflection will be based on the geometry, tolerances, maybe thermal expansion, is something going to, to flex up and, and bump against something, uh, maybe just the nature of the application. If it was a rail, something had to roll over it, what's the tolerance for having a some kind of protrusion? And then shear, again, that would be definitely looking to a yield criteria. We, we don't want it yielding at any point. Um, less likely to be comparing to fracture. So safety factors, tolerances, those will be set numbers. And then within those, we would be looking at what combination of T and C are, are beam dimensions. And maybe material in the form of E will give us our lightest weight. That's, that's typically what we design against since even something that sits still, uh, it typically has to be held up by something else. And so uh, we'd rather be holding up the thing it's holding up. Uh, we might also factor in in a, in a more um, holistic engineering design, uh, disposal costs, material toxicity, carbon footprint to manufacture, implement, and repurpose at end of, of service life. So. Um, all of those might push us in the direction of, you know, a, a monolithic steel versus a reinforced concrete versus even things like our um, our newer uh, fiber composite or even back to wood in some cases, seeing a resurgence um, because of repurposing ease and light weighting. It's basically a natural composite. So all of those factor in once we've established what we need in terms of, of this, what could be called the safety parameters. Our longitudinal stress, our deflection, uh, which may be more of a use parameter, and our maximum shear. So that is as beams in a nutshell. Uh, obviously, you can, you can make these examples a little more uh, complicated if you want to use uh, a fit-for-purpose cross-section like an I-beam, an L-beam, which is, is warning not symmetric. Um, and, and other types of specialty shapes. You can vary your modulus with position on the cross section. You can look at multiple different um, cross sections as you go along a beam, not necessarily recommended, but you could smoothly vary them if you've got a, a big change, maybe in shear moment from one place to another. Lots of options um, that you can analyze. Bear in mind, um, you can analyze it, you can design it, but a final caveat to you future engineers, whatever you design has to be fabricable, it has to be implementable and inspectable in the field, and it has to be disposable. So uh, basically don't, uh, don't select things without a thought to end of life disposition, um, overall material energy balance, uh, because quite often the costs associated with those far exceed the initial cost of the structure you're building, whether it's a single large piece of civil infrastructure or a mass-produced item. So we are done with beams. So um, look forward, depending on where you are in your study of mechanics of materials, um, other applications of these, these fundamental stress-strain relationships would include torsional shafts and columns uh, with buckling criteria. So um, please uh, look forward to those lectures if you haven't already heard them. And thanks for your attention.